Hey everybody, I'm Will. You can see my name right there on the screen. I'm playing double duty today. I'm both the host of this session and one of the presenters of this session. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. I'm going to put on my host hat for just a second uh, to quickly read a moderator statement, welcoming everyone and asking you all to be respectful uh, of everybody else in the community. And then I'm going to take that hat off and I'm going to kick off a presentation along with my colleague, Peter Yassi, and we're going to talk some about open education and copyright, my two favorite things in the world. So quickly welcome everyone. Before this session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and the time you're taking up, by being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege at play, by being considerate of others' desires for privacy, by being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment, and by actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. So having said that, I'm going to take off that hat and put on this one. The presenters may now begin. And again, I'll say welcome. Thank you all for having us here and for being here. Uh, we're really excited to have this conversation about the code of best practice and fair use, something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about years. Uh, Peter, would you like to say a quick hello before we jump into it? Hi, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Great. So we're we're gonna we're gonna go forward here. Do feel free to put questions or comments in the chat. We'll do our best to leave some time at the end as well, but we really are excited to hear what you have to say. I see transcription is going as well. So what we're gonna cover in the next 50 minutes or so, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the importance to open education of including both Creative Commons licensed and um, resources that are available under different copyright exceptions and limitations, particularly fair use. Um, Peter is gonna talk a little bit about the importance and the role of fair use and the power of codes of best practice as a way of sort of putting that into practice. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the core principles articulated in this code and some of the values that undergird that work. Um, then we're gonna lead a discussion about applying the code in your own communities of practice. And then as I say, we'll try to leave a little bit of time for questions and discussion. Great. So let's jump right into it. Um, something that we have been saying a lot, every place anyone has allowed us to say it, is that when we talk about creating open educational resources, it's important to continue to do the great work we've been, been, we've been doing, building on openly licensed materials and openly licensed, licensing the things that we made. But it's also important to be more explicit about the ways we have already been doing and to be more aggressive and thoughtful about doing more of reliance on works in the public domain and works used in reliance on fair use and other limitations and exceptions. So our, our core thesis at some level is that the best OER, the most inclusive, the most invitational, the most up-to-date, the most competitive in some sense and, and most exciting OER are those that build on these three types of resources. The stuff that's in the public domain, either because it's fairly old or because it's not the sort of thing copyright is supposed to protect in the first place, facts and ideas and these sorts of things. Um, I think that's something we as a community do fairly well so far. Um, relying on CC licensed materials, something I think anybody who has spent any time with OER has gotten pretty comfortable relying on the different licenses and the way they play together or do not in different capacities. And so the area that we really wanna spend our time talking about today is, is what we've got as number three here. Materials that are only available in reliance on copyright exceptions and limitations, such as fair use in particular. Um, and I think it's important to say that, that this is going to help make OER better, but in some sense, it's also gonna facilitate the creation of OER that would otherwise be impossible to do or impossible to do a very good job of in some sense. That you could imagine a few um, maybe hard science or mathematical disciplines where it's possible to create OER with just the stuff inside your head, but that by and large, good OER creation is not a closed book exam. It's not something where you sit down at a desk and you can't look at anything or refer to anything or build on anything that's come before, that in fact, the way we do teaching and learning, the way we do creation in almost any field and discipline is explicitly about that standing on the shoulders of giants and saying, you know, Peter said this and here's why I think he's wrong or Meredith said this and I couldn't have said it better, so I'm going to let her voice shine through there as well that the good work that we do is predicated on quotation, engagement with, building upon, challenging, all the stuff that fair use is uniquely well-designed to let us do well in some sense. 
Um, so quickly, I want to say that I, I think this, this is important work to do. Um, and at the outset, to say these two things in the bullets here. First of all, fair use, because it's one of the most flexible exceptions, it creates this wide range of opportunities for us to engage with, with different uh, types of material in terms of what medium we're pulling from, in terms of what source it comes from, and all these other things as well. So it's, it's a very uh, wide net that captures a lot of important materials. And that it lets us do the sort of stuff that we know we ought to be doing anyway, right? That we know that a good researcher reads the literature and brings it into the work that they're doing. A good student engages with the assigned materials and brings them in and engages with them. That that idea of good pedagogy as good fair use is really central to the arguments that we're making and the opportunities we want to highlight today. That what this is about is not enabling you to get away with something sneaky. It's not about um, telling you to do something that you don't want to do, but you really ought to because we're going to guilt you into it. We're saying your, your basic instincts as a creator of educational materials are telling you, I should quote this great person. I should critique this source with a close reading. We just want to empower that sort of behavior and that sort of activity. That's what we're trying to do. And we think that's important to do because it makes the best OER, but because when we don't rely on fair use, when we're hesitant or uncertain or sort of retreat to what can feel like the safer environs of Creative Commons license exclusively, there are costs to that decision. There are costs, uh, particularly to students with disabilities or who need particular forms of access. Um, there are also deep costs to mission risks. We make less good materials, which makes the individual OER less powerful and, and sort of successful, but also makes the enterprise of creating open educational resources as a whole less, less credible and less impactful when we don't rely on this full suite of exceptions. Um, and as is always the case, when we make those decisions, those risks are borne disproportionately by the type of student who are already bearing disproportional risks. If we don't rely on fair use to bring in new and different voices, it's going to be the same voices we always hear. Who are going to be people who look a lot like me, by and large. Um, and so marginalized and underrepresented voices in particular are uniquely um, sort of in need of what fair use can provide in terms of opening it up to different voices and different examples that the original author identifies and that people participating in the resources can bring to bear as well. So that's the, that's the quick and dirty of why we're really excited by this and we've spent the past couple of years working on it. I'm gonna hush up now and let Peter talk some about fair use as a, as a doctrine and as a tool and then these codes of best practice as a way of putting some of these opportunities into practice. Thank you, Will. And let me just say back to begin with, let me do, just do a bit of terminology before we go any further. And that is when you read the document or when you, as you listen to us talk about the, the OER code of best practices and fair use, you'll hear us use, you'll read, and then you'll maybe hear us use the term insert. And the insert is the, is the kind of, it's the portmanteau term that we've adopted for all of the things that Will described so well a moment ago, all of the situations in which your teaching materials are gonna be better, clearer, more engaging, more productive, if you can pull in from outside and insert an image, a chunk of text, a few bars of music, a little bit of audio visual, whatever it is, and we'll talk in a moment about some of the, the subcategories in which that, that kind of, in which fair use inserts are justified. So if that terminology seems exotic, it's just what we've adopted in this project to cover this range. And then I guess the other thing I would want to reemphasize about these, these fair use inserts in OER is something Will has already made very clear, and that is they're really important because although there's a lot of old stuff in the public domain and there's a certain amount of new stuff that's available on open licenses, most of the material that was produced in all of the categories that I've just described in what might be described as the long 20th century is still protected by copyright and not available on either of those other bases. So there's a, you know, a pretty big gap in there. If you're, if you're trying to, to, to 
create materials from which students from which teachers will be able to teach and students will be able to learn about 20th century stuff. So let's have the next slide, please. <laughs> I could go on, and believe me, I could go on because I did it for 50 years at length. Um, you pick a length, and I could do it about the fair use doctrine. Here's the here are the really the only things you need to know now about the law of fair use. One is something that Will has already suggested, and that I want to emphasize, and that is that fair use is a right. It's something that where the doctrine applies, you are entitled to do because by doing it, by taking advantage of the fair use doctrine, you're actually furthering the cultural and the constitutional principles of copyright law. And the, the, the statute says explicitly fair use is a right. It also says explicitly just in case you were still confused, fair use is not an infringement. So where fair use applies, there's nothing sneaky about it. There's nothing transgressive about it. You aren't getting away with anything. It's just what you're entitled to do. Now, how do you know whether it's what whether you're entitled to do it? Well, most of you have read Section 107 of the Copyright Act, so you know that there are four factors that are mentioned that fair users were considering fair use or courts were evaluating fair use after the fact are supposed to take into account um, nature and purpose of the use and the nature of the material being used and the amount of the use and the, the, the market impact of the use. Those are in the statute. Unfortunately, they're not expressed in the statute in a way that provides a great deal of pinpoint guidance. So our courts, which have the job of interpreting this statute, have very helpfully, especially over the last 25 years or so, during which they've been very helpful, they've sort of boiled this down into a rubric, into a formula that can be practically applied by them when they have to decide whether something was a fair use or by us when we're trying to decide whether something would be a fair use. The first consideration uh, in this simplified fair use rubric that the courts have been have have given us, and when I say courts, by the way, I mean all of them in the federal system, and they're the only ones who count because they're the only ones who hear copyright cases, up to and including the Supreme Court, which spoke first about this a quarter century or so ago, and was heard again in the in, in its last term to kind of reinforce and validate everything that I'm about to describe to you. So it's pretty stable as law goes. It doesn't get much more stable than this. Um, you know, if it were, you know, I should say it's pretty stable as far as the kind of law that depends on judicial interpretation for its content is concerned. Have the courts go into depth about it and say something and then come back 25 years later and say, yeah, that's what we meant. And in fact, we meant even a little more than you may have guessed. That's good. So first question, are you doing something new and different with the material? Um, in, in, this gets translated in, in, in jargon into the question of whether the use is for a transformative purpose, but it's really a simple idea that the Supreme Court in this recent Google, Google Google against Oracle case basically said a, a transformative use is a, a use that 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 leads to something new and important. So think education. Well, quite often, maybe always, but certainly quite often, what we are doing as educators with 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 insert material with copyrighted bits and pieces is transformative in that in that respect um something started life as one thing as a as a as a news story or as a popular song or as a hollywood movie now we're trying to make some kind of point about it we're trying to or we're trying to use it to make some other kind of point and all of those are within the the the, the ambit of transformative use so then there's a second question 
If the answer to the second question, the first question is yes. The second question is, okay, um, are you using an appropriate amount? Not the least possible amount, not the smallest you could possibly use. In this recent Google against Oracle case, the Supreme Court was very clear in saying, no, 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 that it's not the test. The test is, is the amount you're using appropriate to the purpose for which you're using it? So you've got a little give there, you've got a little leeway. You can also easily imagine, you know, excessive uses, you know, if I'm talking about a short poem and I decide to reproduce the whole, the whole book of poems in which that poem appears, that's probably too much. So if the answer to both these questions is, is, is yes, then that's pretty much the end of the inquiry. Um, it means among other things that you're not using the copyrighted work from which you are pulling this insert in a substitutional way. The fact that you're using it isn't going to prevent somebody else from going and, and, and buying the whole book to read on, on, uh, at the bookstore or, or streaming the whole song to listen to it on Spotify. And so that's where the law of fair use stands. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty positive in terms of the scope of the doctrine, pretty straightforward and easy to apply. Sometimes one hears this fair use is, is confusing or difficult or hard, uh, unpredictable, um, uncertain is a, is a word that comes to mind. There is, is, and, and all of that is, is, might have been true 35 years ago, I don't know. It certainly isn't true now. Over the last 25 years, as I've said, there's been a tremendous amount of clarification, and I would even argue simplification in the law of fair use. It's now highly predictable. And in fact, there's no reason, therefore, that people who actually do the things, who engage in the practices that would benefit from fair use, including people who make OER, shouldn't themselves be in on the secret. Uh, there's no reason why the people who actually do the work shouldn't be given the tools they need to make their own accurate, robust, defensible, comfortable predictions about what will be, and of course, by implication, what won't be fair use. And that's where these best practices documents come in. Um, my colleagues at American University and various associates and and collaborators and other institutions have over the last 16 years or so worked on a whole series of these. Maybe there are 20 of them. I, I didn't stop to count, but you can you can follow the link and find out if you want to. And in each case, what we've done um, is we've 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 heard from a, a practice community like filmmakers or librarians or 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 specialized archivists or scholars in a particular field that they're that they need it they need a tool that they need a, a way forward they need a way of making fair use work for them and then we've collaborated with those communities to come up with a guidance document that works for them and that doesn't mean a, a document that is full of sort of you know complicated legal to gobbledygook because that doesn't work for anyone or oversimplified prescriptions, you know, 10 words of this or 5% of that. Those, those, those things that you see on websites sometimes are equally unhelpful and, uh, and, and, and even more untrue. It's, that's just the, the urban folklore of, of copyright law. It should be disregarded. Well, what we've worked, tried to work on with, with communities and close collaboration is creating documents that will help them to see their way through from the beginning of a, a fair use question through a, an analytic process to a comfortable and 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 I've used the word before, but I'll use it again, defensible 
conclusion. And we think obviously that that will be heard, obviously, and Will heard it and Meredith, they're the two members of our team who are closest, Meredith Jacob at, at American University are the members of our team who are sort of closest to the OER community. And I think both of them in particular heard, yeah, this would be a useful thing in, if it could exist. It would help with a whole, a whole lot of problems. It would help with, with doing a better job teaching just to mention a few things that are here on the slide, skills of media literacy in the midst of a, of a growing misinformation crisis. And it would help with language learning where what students often need the most, or at least at beyond a certain point, need very badly are real world language materials to, to practice their skills on and to interact with. And of course, a point Will made earlier, which I cannot stress enough, especially given the demonstrations of the fact of the proposition that we have seen in the course of our pandemic year. Of course, the other reason to do this, if we can, is that the more comfortable, the more confident, the more grounded OER makers are in incorporating insert materials, copyrighted insert materials into the, 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 the textbooks and other uh, educational aids they make, the better that's going to be for students with all kinds of um, specific needs. Students who don't have a, a great broadband connection and who therefore are gonna function a lot better with electronic materials where everything is in the package than they are in ones that require them to be constantly online at a high speed. Students who have various kinds of, 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 of disabilities that involve processing and for whom the presentation of material in digital formats that can then be converted for their purposes into accessible formats is very important. I could go on, you get the point. Next slide, please. So we worked for a year and a half with the community, many, many conversations, discussions back and forth. And what came of that collaboration was this code of best practices, which is, as I said earlier, a tool for getting, oh, I think next slide actually is good here. It's a tool for, for, for use in, in both institutional and edu individual copyright educational, uh, copyright education settings. It's a guide to reasoning. It is, we hope, something that will make new makers or potential new makers in OER feel comfortable about joining the field because it's gonna make it easier for them to do good work. It's also a tool that, and we have the experience of, of 16 years with other codes of best practices to know this is true. It, it's a tool that may turn out to be very helpful to OAR makers who are trying to persuade somebody else in their world, maybe even somebody who has a kind of gatekeeper role who stands between them and getting their work out to the audience, these codes of best practices can be very useful in helping explain to your, I don't know, your chairman or chairwoman or your, your, your general counsel or somebody else who's got a kind of risk management function in your institution, that this is really not a big risk, that this is just, this is what people do all the time in every field. And then maybe someday um, we'll actually get to a point at which these codes of best practices will be um, influential on court decisions about fair use. We may have gotten there already, there's a fascinating case, we can talk about it later if you want to, um, called um, Murano against the Metropolitan Museum, in which the 
defendant institution relies very heavily on one of these codes of best practices in making its fair use defense. And it wins very comprehensively and enthusiastically. Unfortunately, the code, now code, the court never gets around to mentioning the code. So from our standpoint, it's less than a perfect, but it's a good example of an actual real world case in which a, a big rich institution, which wouldn't have had to do so, thought that the best way of going ahead and making a fair use defense was to say, look, everybody in our field, the museum field in that case, agrees that this is a sensible application of fair use. And the court nods and says, yeah, good, we'll, we'll go with that. Next slide, please. Code is not, as I mentioned, um, a, uh, a set of metrics. We don't think that that these rules of thumb and so forth that, that I mentioned earlier are, are particularly useful. Um, it, it isn't, and this is such an important point, and I want to emphasize it, 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 it isn't a guide to open licensing. Open licensing is great. Open licensing is really important. Um, this isn't a guide to open license, nor for that matter, is it a guide to figuring out whether things are in the public domain or not. The, 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 these other two important sources of inserts for OER material have to be, uh, if you want to learn about them, you have to look elsewhere. Fortunately, there are many elsewheres to, to which you can look. The OER community has done a very good job and and will can will provide uh, leads and 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 pointers um, to the to the results. The OER community has done a very good job in creating educational materials, including a whole series of wonderful courses that um, are 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 helpful on those in those regards. And it also isn't about fair use in education or at large. You know, there are questions about what you can do in the classroom, and there are questions about what you can do on your your course site, um, or what the library can do if it's maintaining somebody's course site. Those are important questions, and they do have some overlap with the uh, the questions about OER. But you've got to look elsewhere for detailed description of discussions of those. The some of the other best practices codes are pretty good for that purpose. The uh, Association of Research Libraries code is especially good um, if you want more information about that. So the code is a lot, but it's not everything. Certainly not everything for everyone. Next slide, please. Here's one more thing it's not. It, it isn't, regardless of what anyone may tell you, it isn't a kind of you know, wild-eyed, radical left document that uh, expose it that expresses controversial, unreliable, liminal positions on these issues. It is by design and the methodology used to arrive at it, which is fairly thoroughly described in the document itself, is designed to assure that it is a centrist document. The views expressed in the code are broadly held within the OAR community, and we haven't invented any of those views. We really just captured them as, as reliable facilitators and then tried to put them into shape. Then we did another thing. Um, just to make sure that this would, couldn't be couldn't be seen as as sort of far out or radical, and that is that we passed it by a whole bunch. Here are the list of names. Some may be familiar. I assure you, they're all people of 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 high probity and 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 rigorous intellectual independence. None of whom had any other association with our project. And their job as, as lawyers or lawyer librarians, uh, as the case may be, was to look at what we had done with the OR community and say, yeah, that makes sense, or maybe that doesn't make sense. 
and there is there was some back and forth between us and them. There were some changes made as a result, but you can be sure here that of this very sort of solid middle of the road bunch of experts has also blessed the document. I also, for, for any of you who are interested in Canada and the law of Canada, I wanna point out the first name on this list, which is alphabetical, but the first name on this list is the name of Professor Karis Craig of, of, of Osgood Hall. And Karis is a wonderful Canadian copyright expert. And she not only vetted the, the document as a whole to make sure that the things we were saying about US law would also make general sense in a Canadian context. But she wrote a very interesting appendix to the, the document explaining at somewhat greater length why the propositions, the principles um, that the code expresses are easily translatable into Canadian law. Which brings us to those principles, what's in the code. And before I talk about the particular items that are there, here's just a, one slide about structure. We listen to people tell us their stories. We try to group their stories into categories. Those categories eventually sort of congealed into, into use cases. There turned out to be four major use cases that we were hearing about recurrently. We did our best to describe them concisely, but with examples. And so the code is structured around those four use cases. And each subsection of the, of the code begins with a statement of the use case. That is followed by a much briefer bit of prose, which is the statement of the principle, the principle being that in general, fair use is applicable to the incorporation of inserts to which or the kind of incorporation of inserts to which the use case in question looks. The next cat the next subsection of each of the 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 subdivision the next section of each of the subdivisions of the code is a list of sort of considerations, things you ought to think about in particular in deciding whether or not the general statement of principle as applied to the use case as a whole actually governs in your specific situation. And then at the conclusion under each of the use cases, there's a section we're calling a hard cases, things that came up that, that perhaps we didn't have a, a, a conclusive answer to, um, sort of you know limiting cases or in some cases, situations about which we, there are pretty good answers, but the, the analysis that, you get you, that gets you to the answers is somewhat more complex. So those are worth a read. They don't, they don't shadow the ones that come before, but they are, they are, they are nevertheless uh, important. So what are the four use cases? Well, here's the first one, criticism and commentary, the, the historic sweet spot of copyright fair use analysis, the, the, the eight lines of poetry that are gonna be discussed in tomorrow's class or that have been, are being set as the, the topic for a student essay or that you want them to consider as a kind of as a kind of bridge to the following unit, the the nature of the utility can be different. What all of those examples have in common is that this content is being presented because the expectation is that the student, the user of the materials, is going to be doing something with it, or you're going to be doing something with it. Then we've got um, another kind of insert which are really the, the illustrative ones. In other words, you know, if, if, you, wanna, if you wanna teach about the, the civil rights uh, struggle of the 1960s or about the history of, of 
conceptions of 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 artificial personhood in 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 Hollywood, uh, you know, in entertainment filmmaking, whatever. There are images that are going to be important to present, to kick off the discussion, to frame the discussion. These aren't necessarily images that are going to be discussed at length. They aren't necessarily going to be commented on, but they are going to drive the pedagogical narrative nonetheless. A very important category. For a while, maybe 20 years ago, there was some argument about whether this was an eligible fair use category. No argument anymore. It is. Then we've got, as our third major use case, this one. Um, the illustration here is, is from a, a Brazilian telenovela that could be used and that one of the instructors we spoke with was in fact using as a as a vehicle for exposing students in their in their intermediate class in in Brazilian Portuguese to the the lived the lived language as distinct from the 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 preserved language so to speak and uh, you know this is this is any any one of you who is involved in language instruction knows how important this can be think for a moment about this in terms of fair use this is a a a, a thing um, that began life for one purpose as a kind of an entertainment product and now it is being taken over and parts of it not all of it by any means but parts of it are being used to help teach a set of very specific language lessons. It is, as was true with the other two that I mentioned earlier, illustration and critique and commentary, an obvious example of transformative use. Finally, a, a number of, of, of OER makers, especially experienced ones, wanted to know whether there was anything that this document could provide them in terms of guidance around using the, the structural elements, I'll say, or parts of the structural elements of, of, of out of print or otherwise, otherwise X market educational materials in their own or as as a basis for their own new training materials <clears throat> maybe there's a 25 year old book which in some respects which no one uses anymore it, which is in some respects uh, clearly very outdated but has a really good basic framework for presenting the material. Is that, could that be available on the basis of fair use, on the basis of some other copyright uh, doctrine, perhaps? That is the subject matter of this fourth and final use case. So four use cases, four principles, all strongly affirmative with respect to the application of fair use to them. Siri considerations to be borne in mind in in, in applying fair use, some of which we've adverted to already, others of which we can discuss in, in what's to come. And then finally, an acknowledgement of the fact that at the limits, like every other legal doctrine, like every other idea, really, there are, there are hard cases that deserve further thought with respect to each of these categories. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Peter, for that great discussion of fair use and the code. I learn something every time I get to present with you or listen to you. So thank you very much. Um, I want to make sure we have time for some questions. So I'm going to quickly mention some of the other things that are in that document that we're sharing and then open up the floor to talk about how we can apply this in different ways. So very quickly, the other thing, along with the principles that we heard loud and clear, was when you rely on fair use in an, in an, an artifact that is openly licensed, you need to make it clear that not everything in that OER is in fact openly licensed. So we had a lot of conversations about marking fair use. When you include an insert, as Peter described, making it clear to the reader and especially to the downstream reuser that you're relying on fair use. 
And we identified several different ways of doing that. Rather than prescribe the one right way to mark fair use, we said the right thing to do is to mark fair use in the way that is comprehensible and clear to the communities you're engaging with. That could be indirect, that could be direct, or there could be some hybrid version of it as well. You may have noticed in the slides above, we specifically said this item has been used in reliance on fair use as described in the code you can see it at the bottom there. We did exactly that, right? Um, there are also some presentations where I just at the end say, unless otherwise marked, items are included under the code of best practice. But one way or the other, making it clear Correct. so nobody goes in misunderstanding the legal source for that insertion. The other thing to say is that Peter alluded to the appendices as an important resource, and I just want to second that. Um, Karis's discussion around Canadian law is, is really, really useful and powerful and important. We also provide some other information around how the code was created, how sort of neighboring uh, copyright issues exist in different ways and neighboring IP doctrines fit in or don't fit into this work as well. Um, we could have spent the whole 50 minutes just talking about the appendices and had a great discussion, but for now I'll just gesture towards them and say they're, they're great to know about as well. And then the thing I wanted to make sure to say loud and clear is that the core values that you see woven throughout the code are the touchstones. When you, when you take a particular principle and you wonder how does it fit in this context, come yeah. back to these touchstones. Attribution is important, as I said, um, but in particular, fair use is doing its best work when it's being used as a tool for equity and accessibility. And so the, the question that we got very often isn't linking out okay. Our answer was always linking out is not always okay. Fair use is important to use, one, because fair use is a muscle, and if you don't use it, it, it you know, atrophies in some sense, but two, because links have all the problems pedagogically and in terms of accessibility, that fair use is designed to remedy and solve for us. You're here. So please rely on fair use, particularly when you're meeting those core values. And um, I must say, as, yeah, someone, as someone new to the field, as we looked at examples of fair use, I saw, from my perspective, um, really interesting and clear examples of excellent um, open, open educational research products that were significantly marred by their excessive reliance on linking out. Absolutely, yes. And as, as you said, Peter, the pandemic has given us a crash course in why yeah, yeah. an especially sort of insufficient way to do that, that yeah. work. Um, so now I'm gonna open it up for discussions. Please do add comments in the chat or questions. I've answered a couple in chat already. Um, or feel free to unmute. While you're gathering your thoughts, I'm gonna quickly say a couple things about how we think the code can be applied in a particular community, but we're really excited to hear what you think as well. Um, so Peter alluded first to the opportunities to use the code to update our practices, the way we do these things. Um, the code itself has some educational value in terms of understanding how fair use works as a general doctrine and in particular contexts. Um, so that can be for self-study, that can be to share with others, We've done a lot of webinars with individual practice communities who said, we know what the code is. We just want to talk through how it works in this context. So it can be an educational doc document in that sense. Um, and then thinking about how your local community, um, whether that's a geographic community or a disciplinary community or a cultural community can engage with that. So the code can help us update our practices. That's one thing the code can help us do. The second thing we're really excited to see the code do, and I think we're going to spend some of our late summer and fall working in the, on this in some specific contexts, is using the code to create new OER, um, to create OER that wouldn't have been possible before, or some of those OER that Peter described that are out there, but they're maybe not as strong as they could be because they haven't had a tool like the code to help them understand fair use, um, to invite new stakeholders in to the work of creating the code who might have been unable to participate before, um, and then we're on the lookout for local publishing projects that would benefit either to create something new or to improve something that's existing. Um, we've got some ideas and we're excited to hear your ideas as well. Um, and then finally, Peter alluded to the value of the code to improve institutional policy, to reconsider the standard way we talk to people about fair use, um, to work with our administration and our council's office and those other gatekeepers that Peter talked about. Um, and we're gonna be doing a webinar with NACUA, the, the folks who run the uh, offices of general counsel to make sure this is something they've heard of. So if you go to your counsel's office, you won't be the first person to tell them about this resource. They'll go, oh, that thing I heard about. I was excited about that. Um, and then finally, as we think about our institutional policies, when we create OER, they must be incorporating fair use in that context as well. 
Um, so I see a comment coming in from Peter. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We're going to be rolling out a variety of documents and resources to support the code. Um, and I'm going to share on the next slide some information here um, about what we're going to be up to. We're going to be doing some of that localization that Peter described in the chat. Um, we're going to be doing webinars with the OEN and other folks to continue to talk about this work. Um, and then we've got this form that I'll try to drop, drop into the chat as well. If you've been listening politely and waiting for the chance to say, I want to do this thing, I've got this great project, this is the place to tell us about that. Or of course, you can email either of us or hit us up on Twitter or wherever, but we're, we're really excited to hear about the work that you're doing. Um, so that's a, that's a nice way to reach out to us. I'm going to leave that on the screen for now. Um, we have, it looks like about one minute, one or two minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, you, you've been waiting for me to, to be quiet so you can actually ask them, um, please unmute and ask now or feel free to drop them in the chat as well. Well, fortunately, this is not your last opportunity. Um, we're gonna we're gonna make as many as we can going forward. So, so you know, read the document, think about it, and and let us know if you want to be involved. But also let us know if there's any support that we can provide to you in your individual capacity, in your institutional capacity. In your in your regional capacity to to help realize the potential of OER through the expanded application of fair use to copyrighted inserts. Absolutely. I'm going to do one other thing that we don't always do, but since I'm the host as well, I have this privilege. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and so, if there are questions you want to ask, but you oh, weren't cool. comfortable asking them on the record, as it were. Um, the recording has